especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. Sun in the blood of our veins, liberation runs. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by the Grassroots Adult Freedom School Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupadia. Let's begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing imperialist, white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchal, capitalist settler colonialism in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way out is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Since we're unapologetically truth-telling, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. To begin on that note, I invite you to join me for one deep breath right now so that we can be as present as is realistically possible moving forward with this dialogue. If you're feeling it, do inhale then exhale with me right now. Thank you for showing up to do this work. Let's dive right in. To the place where we can all attain emancipation from oppression. Break the chains from Haiti to Tibet and worldwide. Don't forget the resistance in our roots and resilience in our breath. In the blood of our veins, liberation runs. We are standing on the shoulders of the ancient ones. Today, it's my pleasure to be in dialogue with Quill Violet Christie Peters about decolonizing sexuality through visual art. She's an Anishinaabeg arts programmer and self-taught visual artist currently residing in Thunder Bay. She's the creator of the Indigenous Youth Residency Program, an artist residency for Indigenous youth that relies on a radically relational praxis that allows youth to reclaim relationships to self, homeland, ancestors, and community while exploring land-based arts practices. Quill holds a master's degree in Indigenous governance on Anishinaabeg art making as a practice of falling in love, and sits on the board of directors for Native Women in the Arts. In her free time, she paints and writes about self-love and self-pleasure as resistance to the settler colonial project, and is very interested in exploring the body as a site of ancestors, homelands, and creation. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and the energy to connect today. I really appreciate that. How are you doing today? I'm good. It's a beautiful day, so I'm good. Mm, Awesome. Uh, Well, you know, I feel like I hardly have words to begin to describe how potent your cultural production and your art making is. This is reflecting in anticipation of our dialogue uh, and you know, taking it back to last summer when Lucy shared with me your self-portrait, Koi Loves Herself Despite All Odds. And aesthetically, sure, at the superficial, it's gorgeous. And the interplay of colors and of imagery and of shapes is breathtaking. And yet, I almost feel as if uh, something that I'm particularly appreciative of about your work is that it almost allows folks to visualize some of what decolonization could look like and after decolonization could look like, which is part of why Mm -hmm. I was so honored to be able to share it with my students. Uh, But I was like, that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of how profound your work is. Also, say, for survivors, making the connection between violence to the land and violence to our bodies and particularly on this continent, First Nations, women's bodies that are disproportionately subjected to violence and violation. Um, So there's also that entire element that I just want to express my most sincere gratitude for. Uh, But then to open the dialogue up, I know that your work takes place within a very specific 
lineage and place and family and nation and context. So would you be so kind as to share with us some of that background about who you are and or where you come from uh, and how you understand the work that you do, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my name's Quill Christy Peters. I'm Anishinaabe from Treaty 3 territory here in Northwestern Ontario, but more specifically a community called Lac de Malac First Nation. Um, and I kind of have like a really interesting relationship to this community. So my father is Anishinaabe, and my mom is Scottish and Irish. I grew up in Toronto, which is pretty far from where I am today, which is in Thunder Bay in Northwestern Ontario. Uh, and I did a lot of my schooling on the West Coast, so I have a lot of really important relationships that I think feed into this work from there as well. Um, but yeah, so my reserve um, was flooded by the government twice. So unfortunately, none of us have been able to live on our territory. There's no housing there. Um, so yeah, for a variety of reasons, I ended up growing up in Toronto. Uh, so I think that really comes into play in my work is talking about the spatiality of colonialism, talking about displacement and genocide, um, and also talking about shame. So I work a lot with Indigenous youth through arts-based programming, and something uh, that continuously comes up is the shame we have around our bodies, our identities, and also like our sense of belonging to certain places. So um, in a lot of ways, I think my work with Indigenous youth has most heavily influenced those two paintings around self-love and what that could look like. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing some of that context. Would you be down to get a little more into some of the work that you do with Indigenous youth around art programming? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, I run like artist residencies for Indigenous youth, um, so they're kind of like really small programs. I typically hire like six Indigenous youth and uh, we work towards uh, like a final project, but the kind of focus of the residencies is on relationship building. So we're trying to basically embody like Indigenous methodologies and Indigenous relationships to art. So talking about that relationship building as a part of art making itself. So in that sense, we kind of go through a curriculum that talks about relationships to self, to community, to our homelands and to our ancestors, all the while kind of like providing indigenous youth with the tools to articulate how the structures of settler colonialism are manifesting in their lives. Um, so that's where kind of a lot of the stuff around shame comes up is once you kind of like show Indigenous youth uh, how to make these connections and how kind of, you know, our disconnection is intentional and part of this larger project, uh, it can help them feel more grounded in their identities, certainly helped me. Um, so that's kind of the work with Indigenous youth. It's art space, but it's not like come learn how to paint or come learn how to bead. It's more about relationship building and creating that space for really just Indigenous youth to feel truly loved, even if just for a moment, you know? For sure. Yeah, thank you mm -hmm. for that. Uh, and what inspired you to get into that kind of work? I know you just sort of alluded to um, its power within your own lived experience. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I started like my education in biology. So I actually did my undergrad in biology and was just like, wow, this is like not what I want to do. Uh, but I kind of powered through the degree and started taking all of these different First Nation Studies courses at UBC and kind of became a part of this network of really amazing Indigenous women. And that's what kind of pushed me to go to just kind of jump into what really matters to me. So I did my master's in Indigenous governance, and in that program, you're kind of given the freedom to uh, like make your thesis about something that you consider governance to be. And so then I started thinking about art as governance. Um, 
and kind of being really self-reflexive about my own experience as a younger Anishinaabe Kwe growing up in Toronto and feeling, you know, like you don't belong. Like there's all those questions of authenticity floating around no matter where you are. So I started to kind of think like what would have helped me or what would have made me feel stronger in who I am and just kind of designed the whole program through that. And so that was really, yeah, a, like a, I wouldn't say fun. It was hard, but it was a really rewarding way to kind of shape a program, which is basically to just speak from our own experiences you know, one thing that I really appreciate as well is I know that you have shared some concern actually about some of the institutional spaces that you've operated within in the past. So whether we're talking about settler colonial institutions like a university or a gallery space, just being really truthful and realistic about the challenges that are presented if you're attempting to do decolonial work or this kind of relational work that involves ancestral remembrance and embodiment that might not be best suited to some of those structures and systems. Um, and so I do really want to sincerely thank you for bravely sharing some of the concerns that you have shared, uh, because that kind of whistleblowing, I feel like, uh, or speaking truth about power uh, is a form of us keeping ourselves and our community safer, potentially, and not necessarily say, devoting time and energy, going down particular avenues that might not be as promising as other sites that we could contribute our offerings and our labor and our time and our energy to. Uh, so thank you for that. And also mm -hmm. I'm wondering, would you be down to share a little bit about precisely that, right? So the spaces where you have done your work so far and or vision, um, being able to share your offerings in the future and how decisions about those sites and spaces, whether they're consensual or not, whether we feel like we have to be in certain spaces for legitimacy or to be able to make a wage, um, how that impacts the work that you're able to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've basically like done most of my youth work out of large institutions. Um, so my first time doing like work with Indigenous youth was at the Museum of Anthropology uh, in British Columbia, and then most recently at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. But my time at the, the AGO was my first time really being like, um, like cutting the path, so like creating the programming, um, creating the space. And it was just like so exhausting, <laughs> like so, so exhausting. So basically, like the AGO has never had programming for Indigenous youth. So I came in there to kind of, you know, provide the programming, provide the knowledge and the insight. Yeah, there were a lot of difficulties around, well, straight up racism in the institution, um, but also kind of the institution not being okay with uh, things that it can't understand. So this desire to always know and to always own and to always claim that were really hard to deal with. And I think with my work is, to me, it's just so embedded in who I am, the knowledge that I bring forward as an Anishinaabe person. I couldn't make certain sacrifices that maybe someone else could have made. So in that sense, it was really like, you know, if we had an issue we had an issue and I wasn't going to kind of sacrifice or back down. Uh, so it was really challenging. But at the same time, like I knew I was only going to be there for a year. So it was kind of like a really kind of neat scenario in a way too, because I didn't have that added pressure of like, okay, this is a job I want for the long term. I've worked really hard to get here. It was kind of like, I'm here, I'm going to like lay it all out for you. I'm going to give you all my knowledge. You can take it or leave it. But afterwards, like I'm leaving, like, so there's no, none of that added pressure. But yeah, it was really hard. There are a lot of issues in that space, even around bringing indigenous bodies into that space, issues with security, uh, just stuff I never honestly would have imagined <laughs> could still be happening at like such a prominent Canadian institution mm -hmm. and I really relied heavily on certain relationships within that space so 
Wanda Nanabush, who's like an Anishinaabe curator there, was like someone I felt safe with and someone who kind of helped me enact sovereignty over my programming. Uh, and Anique Jordan was another artist who was there. And we just kind of like instantly like held on to each other just by virtue of like being in that institutional hostility space, which was a really beautiful thing to happen as well to support each other like that but yeah so many times we would just be like let's get out of here let's go get our nails done you know <laughs> tears and uh-huh. yeah like something I've been reflecting on being out here in Thunder Bay and dealing with this whole other like openness of white supremacy here like it's just it's a very racist place and those structures of white supremacy that are usually somewhat hidden or attempted to be hidden are just kind of like more exposed here and it's been really exhausting but I was I've been thinking a lot about how my experience at the AGO like that kind of I don't know like dehumanization really landed in my body so even though I'm like privileged enough to have the tools to talk about it to identify what's going on to have those like relationships that matter to me in the institution, it's still just like landed in my body. And I really do think like white supremacy, racism, all those structures, like, you know, they like, sometimes like I can't use my body like after things like that happen. And so those like two paintings where I kind of switched from land, painting land to painting body had a lot to do with being in that institutional space and about recognizing like, yeah, what goes into our bodies when we're in that, those spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm so appreciative of you sharing that because I feel like so many folks take Uh, the desire to be included in dominant institutions as a given, as a goal. And I really would love to see more mentorship, especially for younger folks around uh, being as harm reductionist as possible when we do make conscious decisions, hopefully, uh, to engage within dominant institutions, in part because of Uh, how literally toxic they are and how that's not even close to neutral, having all of that, you know, the stress of not just microaggressions, but just unapologetic (laughs) macroaggressions stored up, whether it's just grating away at your nervous system and or so many of the kinds of effects that we see that having and that we also have personally experienced. And so it is something that I really hope that Uh, folks can romanticize a little bit less than I see happening. Because again, that, you know, is not even close to neutral in terms of how it's negatively impacting so many folks, certainly at the sort of bodily or somatic level, but also in terms of our capacity to hope and our capacity to vision in ways that aren't sanctioned by so many settler colonial institutions. And so, yeah, also to be able to find the folks to connect and to build community among allies within those spaces is what's up just as a survival mechanism, if you Mm -hmm. ask me. So thank you for keeping it real and for going there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a real thing for sure. And it was just like so interesting, especially with Anik, just to like, just witness each other in that space and have the ability to talk about what happened, have the ability to even like something as simple as like, Hey, wanna, I have to go grab a coffee or I have to go grab lunch. Do you want to come? Because in those spaces, it's like everything is making you feel less than human. Like you're saying, it's like the microaggressions, it's the things that happen straight up, but it's also like those kind of unnameable things about just, the way people look at you, the slight kind of body language, like all those things add up. And it's just so essential to have just someone to stand beside you and, you know, go get a coffee or whatever it ends up being, you know. (laughs) For sure. Absolutely. (laughs) Right. Uh, Yeah. Banding together amidst adversity of all of the kinds, which can sometimes be sort of low profile or undercover or you know there's so much code switching also that's expected in some of those spaces um and 
you know, the idea that folks should be grateful if they're being tokenized or should self tokenize, right? Or should want to be a sort of native informant and tell secrets in a certain kind of way that doesn't really necessarily honor protocol or context or what's actually appropriate in different settings. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that easier said than done, my goodness. And thank you also for holding space for youth to move through those spaces in a way that hopefully could feel much better and actually supportive of a creative reconnecting process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was interesting because like, I ran the residency program three times in that space. And the first time was kind of like I used a model of, you know, like we went through the curriculum and we followed indigenous methodologies and protocols, but I still maintained the illusion that they were in a, a place that wanted them and that valued them. That was very much like how we were operating. And then by the last residency, I kind of had to make the decision to hire older youth to kind of like be able to bring those conversations to them because it was their safety was being infringed upon anyways. And that illusion was being broken. So I had to shift everything and say, no, we're going to talk about what the institution means to us. We're going to talk about how it commodifies our bodies, how it polices our bodies. Like we're going to talk about all this stuff because I can't protect you. And so that was a hard thing to have to deal with, but yeah, there just was no option. You can't even create the illusion in that space. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm wondering if you might be down to share some of your writing with us. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that you have posted on your website, which is so very generous, your master's thesis, and I've been able to look at a little bit of it. Uh, and I was also so impressed by the article that you published within the past month or so, uh, and so whatever you might feel uh, best about sharing, that would be really special for our listeners, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I pulled up two kind of two little bits that I could read. One is from my uh, master's thesis, which um, is kind of like set the framework for the article that just came out this past, past month. So it's about um, talking about the body as an archive and the body as kind of like a site where our ancestors live and then bringing that into like what happens when you teach indigenous youth that. Um, so that's one thing I have that I could read. Uh, and then the other is just from the latest article. And I, it was hard to find something to read from that because I feel like it like speaks to so much of different parts and it's looped back and all that kind of stuff. But I have a little piece that I could read from that one as well. That would be beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just read it, I guess. Okay. So this great. one is from the uh, master's thesis. Accessing Anishinaabe archives can be a painful process in the settler colonial context. Before colonial occupation, perhaps we did not distance ourselves enough from our archives to ever have to consciously think about accessing them. Settler colonialism has wrought multiple forms of violence that target the relationships that comprise our beautiful Anishinaabe archives. I think of my proximity to state-sanctioned genocide through my father's experience in residential school and my current enmeshment with the now more insidious forms of colonial violence that threaten my existence. They tried to exterminate us, and when that didn't work, they tried to starve, rape, and beat our archives out of us. They didn't realize that you can't remove these relationships from our physicalities, that you cannot break the bond between homeland and body, body and ancestor, ancestor and homeland. They cannot fathom the relational nature of our knowledge, but the violence takes its toll on our bodies and homelands, and for many of us, our archives are enveloped in shame and locked in the confines of trauma. Coming to acknowledge, remember, and strengthen these archives is a painful process because it is a process of falling in love. When we fall deeper in love with our ancestors, they tell us that we have to fall deeper in love with ourselves and with our own bodies that have been marked as disposable and unworthy. When we fall in love with our ancestors, they wrap us in self-love and self-worth, and we weep at how we, might ha we may not have felt these things before. But the deeper we love, the stronger we become. 
The deeper we love, the harder we rage against the violence inflicted upon us by the settler colonial state. When I create art, I am falling in love. Sometimes I am joyous and I relish in the gratitude and meaning that comprises my life. Sometimes this is the most painful process, for as I grow closer to the loving embrace of my ancestors, I carry the trauma, the legacy of genocide, the legacy of violence closer to my bones and my body. But always falling in love is worth it. We deserve the right to fall in love with our own bodies and to feel the love exuded to us from our ancestors and homelands. As Erica Violet Lee beautifully states, allowing love to flow beyond the edges of our skin in the form of touch, our lips in the form of language, and our eyes in the form of tears is necessary and radical in a world where we're taught to believe those borders are impassable. Wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, you, you managed to do it with words, even in the English language, like you do with visual art. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the sort of interplay between your visual art and your words is also so striking. Um, how you're able to visually depict so much of what I hear you speaking to in your writing through visual art is really something that feels so congruent um, and so sort of in sync with one another as if there isn't really a separation. And so that's something that I'm also so drawn to in your work, your capacity to do that um, sort of transcending genres as some folks are sort of socialized to compartmentalize offerings in different areas. So thank you so much also for being able to express something that I imagined wasn't really as expressible in words until hearing you speak to exactly that. And it does describe so beautifully so much of uh, what you share in your paintings. Yeah, the struggle to write, like to write those things, especially <laughs> as an artist, like, it's so much easier for me to just paint a painting than it is to write about that painting afterwards. It's just translating is so hard. And I found with the thesis, like, you can tell that I want to talk more poetic and creatively, but I was like bound by those structures. So I kind of like dance between how I want to communicate and then like, you know, references and, you know, being academic and all that kind of bullshit. Thank you. So, <laughs> right. yeah. For sure. Well, I mean, that to me is one of the things that's so beautiful about uh, having our own independent spaces and autonomous spaces where we don't have to deal with, say, some of the censorship or the gatekeeping of academia or of other sort of mainstream cultural institutions to be able to share more truthfully or honestly and to begin or to continue to sort of steward this process of remembering and nourishing what our languages are. Um, so not just constantly being sort of forced to mimic other styles or patterns of speech under the name of professional development or whatever it might be, right? Mm -hmm. Grooming into different textual communities that so often also, again, isn't neutral. That's, you know, space within our being that isn't being devoted to languages that maybe we already spoke or that we could be speaking were it not for that right so mm -hmm. yeah I'm also so appreciative of like say with the article within this past month offering ways of communicating about the topics that you are engaging that aren't just kind of the sort of sanctioned academic lingo that a lot of folks that move through intellectual spaces on campus or within dominant structures can just kind of normalize or naturalize like that's the way people talk but that's definitely not the way that most people talk yeah. right <laughs> yeah yeah would you be down to share a little bit about what inspired that particular piece of writing that you just shared with us, please? Um, mm -hmm. So whether it's a, that kind of interplay between your understanding of artistic production and then how you communicate about it in words or whatever you feel so inclined to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I remember like that, that chapter of my thesis is around the body as archive, which is actually not like a direction I think I would have gone in had it not been for this conference on the archive that I was a part of. <laughs> so within that framework, like I started to think about like, what does the word archive mean to me? Um, 
you know, and kind of getting all time and spacey about it, which is really my jam and kind of breaking down <laughs> um, like temporality and the concept of the archive and really kind of like teasing through some of those complicated issues in order to create this presentation that was supposed to be centered around involving the archives in some sense. And the conference is mostly people talking about the archive, like practices in the archive and the physical archive. And then I was there and I was kind of the like, woo, like time and space, <laughs> like our ancestors and our bodies. Um, but I really enjoyed like that kind of push in that direction because once I started talking about it, it just made so much sense. So that chapter is really um, based on that presentation I did. And I found that the archive was just the more succinct way for me to reference everything that I'm talking about in my thesis, which is, you know, the body as homeland, as ancestors, as like so much more, right? Like as something that can't be defined. So the archive just became a tool for me to say things a little more succinctly. And I also want to credit um, the work of Gwen Benaway, who is a poet. Her work was, has been, continues to be like so foundational to my thinking and to giving me some of like the language and the prompts to begin to talk about those relationships that we carry in our body. Uh, so at the time I was reading a lot of her poetry and I was doing um, a paper for an indigenous futurisms class uh, where I was reading her work. And so throughout that chapter, I just like insert a lot of uh, like little segments of her poetry. Um, so I want to also like, yeah, say miigwech to Gwen for um, showing me that like talking about those relationships, which are so immaterial and intangible can be possible through the, the written word. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And that is also something that I feel like comes out so nicely when you, the way that you talk about love and the way that you talk about self-love. Um, so whether it's, say, in the context of working with Indigenous youth, and like you spoke to earlier, um, maybe this is one little space where you can experiment with feeling loved uh, or feeling self-love in your body in a way that might not be normal in your life right now. Or literally, if you're talking about, say, within uh, some of your artwork, touching yourself in a loving way that goes against how many of the things that we're socialized into that totally where, right, pleasure is an impossibility for some bodies, right? Like, why would that ever be? How does that support capitalism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Part of the project, right, of genocide on this continent. They're not really commensurate or they're not really compatible. Uh, mm -hmm. And so being able to share those connections with folks in a way that is so visceral and so palpable, and it's not just maybe a sort of... Uh, white feminists talking about orgasmic justice or just getting off divorced from how literally profound it is or how revolutionary it is, particularly for survivors, but again, especially specifically um, situated within the context that your work is being created out of, that as a decolonizing act, that as a decolonial act. Um, and again, not just kind of invoking that term metaphorically by any stretch of the imagination or poetically in excess or to the extreme, but really honoring how important it is for people to be able to be understanding um, those connections in this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And those paintings, like, it's just been so interesting for me too to kind of reflect on the process of creating those paintings. Um, like I really attribute the kind of initial stages of those paintings with uh, my work with those indigenous youth at the AGO, which still that those relationships matter so much to me. And I, I love those youth that I worked with so much, but they're the ones that kind of pushed me or reminded me to think about talking about love, like coming back to me as well. Cause during that year at the AGO, I just, Oh, like I, I had no life beyond 
that work because it just was so heavy and so hard. And I'd always be kind of conceptualizing love as extending towards these youth and how do I create space and how do we love each other without really remembering that I have to reflect that love back to myself and starting to to make the links between crazy things like the institution and like touching myself and self-pleasure and the body and so I really do think that yeah that time at the AGO with those youth started to get me to think about critically about what self-love could look like and that's when I created that first painting and then the second one came not too long after that and those two paintings like I'm a pretty slow artist. I have paintings in this room that have been being worked on for years and I'll often just leave things. Um, But those two paintings just like flew out of me. Like I just, I don't even know. I just created them and then was like, holy shit. Like I don't even, I don't even know. (laughs) And so being able to then write about it in that article was so necessary for me because it's all different ways of communicating things. And so for me, sometimes creating art can be so intuitive and so related to my actual body that sometimes I don't even know what's, what's going on. And so like to be able to sit back and say, okay, I have to communicate what was going on in this painting in words is just brings a whole new level to it. And it was extremely challenging Uh, extremely triggering it was hard um, but it was like yeah very necessary I think and provided a a good context because one thing I didn't want to kind of like uphold with those paintings was that like I was this person who had this like ideal relationship to my body and that like yeah like I'm okay with talking about masturbation. I'm okay with talking about self-love. I love myself. Like, I'm okay with bleeding. Like, I didn't want to just give those paintings to the world without complicating my relationship to them and talking about, like, those paintings more as moments and less as realities for me of how I see my own body. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that piece also, um, because, you know, coming back full circle to your having mentioned shame earlier, um, I know, my goodness, how many hundreds, if not thousands of especially women that I've worked with in the past that um, can sometimes almost feel, I don't know exactly where it comes from, but pressure to perform like we have all the things together all the time and we've always had this amazing relationship within ourselves, including, you know, in English or in the Greek, it would be say erotically, right? You know, I mean, maybe either that or on the other end of the extreme, maybe just being um, so still embodying trauma and trauma responses um, that I haven't personally observed many spaces sort of in the middle to really honor uh, our learning process um, Mm -hmm. and getting really clear about, you know, whatever the practices are that might have been habituated within us, including intergenerationally and on our bodies that we're seeking to consciously re-pattern or to shift or transform into something different. And so just being honest about that, you know, I mean, even just really specifically, I remember one of the first conversations I ever openly had with a buddy, another woman about the first time, her saying something to the effect of that she had been touching herself and masturbating um, and experiencing orgasm since she was maybe a toddler, since she was a little girl. Uh, And that being so mind blowing to me and one of my initial responses being um, feeling that shame, like I'm behind uh, Mm -hmm. or, oh my goodness, you know, something is wrong with me because I haven't had that kind of experience. Uh, And in that moment, divorced from context, divorced from history, divorced from our families, (laughs) divorced from our relationship to our bodies more broadly and other people's relationships to and with our bodies more broadly, 
um, that kind of just sort of individualistic approach can have a lot of shame involved for so many mm -hmm. folks. And so I'm also, again, just really appreciative of your sharing that honestly about how you're negotiating this process on the daily for yourself and not packaging something as if it's, you know, perfectly finished uh, in a context that is, you know, still this right, settler, colonial, imperialist, white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchal capitalist colony, <laughs> rape culture. Uh, and so how would we possibly as connected to the earth <laughs> and each other um, have this perfectly figured out? Our communities don't right now. Uh, and so just being able to share that in a way that's sort of almost destigmatizing or making it um, less taboo to just be really truthful about what we're learning right now uh, is something that is so, uh, it makes space for other people to be able to be that honest also about what they've actually got going on and where they're actually at in their journeys. So I so appreciate that in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will, like it really was so, so like so useful for me to write that too. Because basically I... I have a lot that I didn't put in the article. So uh -huh. even going through that stuff sure. was like really useful. And I was like, oh, they're not going to share that. Yeah. But yeah, so it was it was good. And yeah, one thing I, I wanted to also presence was just um, like being someone who did a master's in Indigenous studies and like doing Indigenous studies in my undergrad, uh, just like speaking back to the ways that um, land-based resurgence is so gendered and so masculine and wanting to really presence my knowledge which is that our bodies are the land too so you know how can we shift how we think about that and kind of bring like the labor of indigenous women and two-spirit and trans and non-binary people up to like that standard or that level that like men's labor is automatically put on to so trying to trying to bring that work to light of like how important it is that we do this work of connecting with our bodies in an honest and open way and how that's to me like the foundation like it, it just you know if I don't feel good in my body if I don't feel rooted in my body if I want to leave my body which is something I kind of you know, a little bit touched upon in that piece, then it doesn't matter if I'm out on the land, it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, doing some traditional practice or cultural practice, like, it's really, to me, like, starts with the body. So I really wanted to put that in there, too, because, you know, we hear a lot about that kind of land-based stuff, which is really important, but... I just want us to think about our bodies as the land too. Right. And, you know, it's precisely that kind of intersection. And, you know, sometimes it can seem, and this doesn't have to be the case, and I'm so excited for the moment in time when there's not this artificial separation, but like some folks are talking about consent at the bodily level here, um, especially maybe say in some sort of feminist or women's spaces. And then some folks are talking about consent over here, especially in more sort of land defense spaces, like maybe say free prior and informed consent and mm -hmm. some language that might come out of say UN declarations on the rights of indigenous mm -hmm. peoples and otherwise, but not um, if we want to talk about consent and learning good consent and practicing good consent and being consensual, we've actually, as I understand it, we need to be talking about both of those things simultaneously. <laughs> and so making the spaces and continuing to nourish the spaces that some of our movement elders and aunties and elders have actually already been holding down for us to be able to do that kind of intersectional work uh so it's not just sort of one or the other and so that's also part of why i'm really excited about your work is because it seems to be um at that intersection honoring that we can care on all of these fronts simultaneously it doesn't have to be either or mm -hmm. yeah i agree <laughs> <laughs> so much work to be done on those fronts so much work to be done right yeah and yeah. for me, like the piece is very unfinished. Like there's so much more work that needs to be done for myself too. Um, so I'm like grateful for this conversation today because 
it's my first time trying to give conversational language about, you know, some of the themes and topics included in those paintings. And yeah, there's just, it's just like one long continuous strand of work. And I, I have a long way to go too, but I think that there's like strength in just acknowledging that as well. So in the paper, it, you know, I allude to certain things. Doesn't mean I can talk about those things yet, if you know what I mean. So also want to like present that too, that there's no, you know, there's no end point really. We're always going to be unpacking and trying to peel off these layers because it's so deep seated. And so, you know, for me, the body isn't just like my body. It's so many other things. There's just so many layers. And I think the hardest one for me, at least in like writing that piece was talking about the par like my parents and like their bodies and situating the body as, you know, talking about our ancestors but not just our ancestors, but like the bodies of our ancestors and what happened to those bodies and how that's in our own bodies too. So yeah, I also don't want the article to stand as like, you know, I have the strength to talk about this kind of stuff because it's a process and I still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah, that humility is also something that I really admire and so beneficial if you ask me to our learning processes, um, because if we're kind of faking it, whether it is at the bodily level, which other people can always, if they're paying attention, see through, <laughs> right? <laughs> but also, you know, so there's that, there's that, right? The body doesn't lie. There's no faking anything bodily if we yeah. are paying attention, <laughs> right, and care enough to observe, but also in terms of our process, you know, um, mm -hmm. part of what I've observed in my life is, you know, we can actually engage our process more fully and be more present to it when we are truthful about what's actually up as opposed to, you know, I'm in a certain space and um, I see other people somewhere else. So maybe I'll just kind of mimic or copy or try to replicate what they're speaking to based on their experience, maybe because I feel like I need to be like that in a certain kind of way. And it sounds funny to me almost to even say that out loud because it's so normalized and we see that in so many spaces. And yet at the same time, that to me is really counter to potentially having a more sort of sincere learning process that is actually informed by our bodies archives, again, that don't lie, that carry with us, right? The patterns and the memories of our parents, like you spoke to, and of our ancestors, whatever those patterns are. Um, and so, you know, if and when the time is right to do the healing work, whether it's drawing upon that intergenerational wisdom and or healing that intergenerational trauma, whatever it might be, to keep it real on that front and not, you know, maybe show up in a certain way to the extent that we can based on us feeling like we need to be somewhere in our process that maybe isn't actually authentic to where we're actually at right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, another thing that was like interesting for me that I wrote about in the piece was just like the autonomy that our bodies have too. So when our bodies say like, no, you're going to, you're going to do the healing process now, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and just like, to me, like experiencing that was crazy. Cause yeah, I guess just like identifying the ways that I deal with like violence and trauma and to kind of be frank about, about those processes that happen in our body. So talking about, um, at least for me anyways, like completely blacking out certain experiences. Like it's like they just didn't happen. And then one day my body said, nope, they happened and you're going to deal with it right now. And to kind of experience that flood of, of emotion and also just like, yeah, you know, also just being so humbled by my body and, and like the gift that that is too of saying, I'm going to allow you to witness this. I'm going to show you this at a time where I know you can handle it. Like our bodies are just so, so beautiful in that way. So I'm happy I got to, to write about that. Cause I think that 
for me and a lot of my relations, like shame can come from those processes that our body has to protect us. So I wrote, like I wrote a little bit about that in the piece is like feeling shame that we don't remember these things or feeling shame that we didn't speak up about them when they happened or uh, like all those different things, why we didn't respond when so much of the time we're just trying to, our bodies are trying to save us, right? And say, okay, that happened. I'll hold on to it. I'll wait till you're ready. And one day I'll let you see it. And so to me, that's like a really beautiful thing. And an even more beautiful thing when you think about the body as a place where our ancestors talk to us and guide us. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, and speaking to that piece, would you be uh, down to share that second excerpt with us from the article yes. that you just published? Yes. Thank All you. Right. Okay. A storm blows in across the lake. This is not one of our storms, the kind that houses the Thunderbirds and allows water to dance between earth and sky. This storm is artificial, reeks of hatred, greed, and evil. This storm sweeps all, up all of the tiny Anishinaabe bodies, searches to find the ones that hide in the arms of loving grandparents deep in the bush. The body of my seven-year-old father is broken again and again, night after night, and in the distance, a soft and steady rumble in the belly of a lake. The land trembles in pain. I am born from within this storm. I look to my mother's body for solace but cannot find any, violence in her blood that mixes with my father's and becomes mine to carry. But blood is water, ancestors drumming. We have always endured the violent storms of the settler colonial weather, at the end of a particularly awful storm, I find myself a young Anishinaabe Kwe in the big city, born away from my homelands. Settler colonialism has crafted a world where our bodies are considered separate from our homelands, because only when these are considered distinct can we forget where we come from and who our ancestors are. They have introduced toxic identity politics that tell us we are less indigenous if we live off of our territories, have forced us to abide by the Indian Act, have wrapped us in a dark shame that makes us think it is our fault for the ways we have been dispossessed. I chuckle deeply to myself because they did not realize that body and homeland cannot be separated, that they are not distinct entities, that no matter where our bodies are, we can feel our homelands in the night, can hear our ancestors murmuring and humming under our skin, can feel the lakes and rivers that we come from slowly trickle over rock. They can never fully comprehend our universe. Water taught me this. Water from land and body, from outside and inside, has taught me that the knowledge, teachings, and ancestors that dance through rock and water, forest and sky, also dance within our own bodies. Water teaches me that we hold internal knowledge, that body is homeland, and that our ancestors are always with us, feeding us teachings and guiding our hands. They will do anything to keep us from entering into this relationship with water. So potent. Thank you for that. Would you be down to elaborate on some of what inspired that section in particular? I'm especially curious about if you're open to talking about healing. So the role that healing plays in this work for you, whether it's the healing processes that you have had to engage to be able to offer these gifts and or potentially say the healing that you hope uh, your work might be able to be supportive of for folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess that that little part of the piece um, was really about like my relationship to water and thinking through how that relationship has helped me to heal, but also thinking through how that relationship has been explicitly targeted by the settler state. So just like I mentioned at the beginning of this, like my reserve has a history of flooding. And so the ways that I see myself being impacted by colonialism is very much intertwined with water, like the water of our territories, 
Um, but also the water of our bodies, especially when I think about, you know, my father and my auntie's experiences in residential school, um, the kind of like horrors of, of that, um, but also the ways in which like sexual violence was weaponized to alter and disfigure our relationship to our own waters and to our own bodies. So I started to think about water in that way and also connecting that water to waters like when we're turned on so thinking about um healing as you know the moments where I feel at ease sitting by the lake like I live um on Lake Superior here in Thunder Bay um, but also how how that water heals me every time I touch myself Um, So starting to think through that as a more radical practice and how kind of like talking about the challenges that I have with loving myself and loving my body is actually a a practice of healing for me because it kind of um, gives me the context and gives me the context to understand why I might be struggling with some of these things. So like previous to this work, you know, I feel like I did a lot of performing in my own sexualities and then was kind of like later in life actually triggered not by like a violent situation, but by consent. So having to experience consent for the first time and then going like, holy shit, this is like the first time I've experienced consent and reflecting on all those previous kind of, you know, relationships and how those have played out and kind of having that picture to look at connecting it with, um, like violations of indigenous women's bodies in the project of settler colonialism helps me to like keep that shame at bay and to keep those kind of Um, feelings of not being worthy enough or that something's wrong with me because I don't know if I presence this enough in the piece but like yeah masturbation for me is also a struggle it's not like a practice that's uh, like doesn't come easy for me and so acknowledging that full context of why why and how and and what the body really means to me helps me to to do that healing work. And I hope that um, other people can see see their own experiences in that. Um, But I was also really cognizant of wanting to keep it rooted in my experience and to keep it rooted in the lives of um, like indigenous peoples here. So wanting to avoid other like non-indigenous survivors of sexual violence to appropriate that language, especially because there's so much in there about colonialism, but also water. So I was trying to be cognizant of that too. And to say, this is my experience. Don't, don't appropriate it like you do with everything else. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But just, I, I do hope that it, it provides healing for people. And I've got a lot of, um, positive responses and it was yeah nice to get those responses because with the painting like especially the the menstruation one I just got a lot of you know violent reactions so it was nice to have that piece to provide more context and then to hear the ways that it's impacting different people to think about uh, or just to know that like other people go through this stuff And likely we are all going through this stuff as like indigenous people because, you know, settler colonialism as a project intent on stealing and occupying our land. If we start to think about land as body, our bodies are continuously being violated as well. So just trying to, you know, just be honest and to acknowledge the privileges I have to be honest you know, to be able to write that piece, to be able to, you know, have a life where I can paint those paintings is a privilege. So just kind of taking a deep breath and reminding myself that, 
you know, it's kind of a responsibility in a way. So that's how I conceptualize it. But I do hope that it helps healing. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for everything that you've just shared. And I'm wondering, we've talked about so much, if you would want to follow up on or elaborate on anything that we've gotten into so far. Hmm. We have talked about a lot, hey? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, yeah, it's important for me when talking about that article, um, yeah, to recognize the stages that I go through, like how um, painting is one form of communication, then writing is another, and talking is another. And so like acknowledging this conversation too as a place of learning for me as well. And I'm happy that other people are going to see this too. And I think it provides like a fuller picture. But yeah, I don't know. I can't think of anything in particular that I want to speak to. Um, I think it's like worthy to note, yeah, that when you do do this kind of work, um, it puts us in a place of violence as well, and it makes me feel unsafe. Um, so just thinking through, yeah, the sacrifices that it also takes to generate that kind of work, because I think this work is like so important and so powerful that it's really threatening to a lot of people, especially like for some reason people just cannot like fathom someone masturbating while they're bleeding like the first painting <laughs> was fine the second one just you know everyone freaked out and especially like white men freaked out mm -hmm. and living in Thunder Bay I don't know like how familiar you are with Thunder Bay but it's a really racist place it's a place where uh, there's a lot of hate crimes. Um, it's a place that I've just moved to where countless women have told me, do not walk by yourself, do not walk at night. So it's it's different kind of, um, the proximity to violence is different than in like say Toronto. In Toronto there's still violence and it's still there. But for some reason in Thunder Bay, it just feels like you're on the cusp of it all the time because things are so out in the open. And when I released that painting, um, I was like posted onto this website called Concerned Citizens of Thunder Bay, which is basically just a white supremacist website on wow. Facebook or a Facebook group. And it just made me feel really unsafe because this painting had like, pissed someone off so much that not only were they saying like it's disgusting take it down but actually kind of like mobilizing and saying what do you guys think about this this is a person who lives in Thunder Bay um so that kind of stuff so I also want to present that um we need to build strong communities of support as people continue to produce this kind of work um and in the context of Thunder Bay in the context of masturbation and in indigenous women feeling good in their bodies, that can be like a really real threat of violence. So it's something I've been thinking about a lot, um, especially because Thunder Bay is a small place and you kind of see people all around town. And yeah, I just think that those um, kind of networks of support need to be especially in place as people continue to do this work around the body. Yeah, I really appreciate your mentioning that backlash and retaliation are real and disproportionately fall on some folks' shoulders more than others, mm -hmm. uh, understandably and predictably so. And so Thank you for sharing that element of the response to your work also. Um, to me, it's really important in terms of just being ethically principled uh, whenever we're sharing examples from our lived experiences, and especially if it is something of a very intimate and personal nature, even though, of course, it's also political and systemic. 
uh, to support folks knowing that there are consequences um, in a variety of different ways to sharing in that capacity. Uh, and then also to be able to recognize uh, when folks do make those decisions like you have, um, that it is indeed like you just spoke to, at risk um, and a sacrifice. And so then hopefully folks can be more supportive um, and can recognize and honor that accordingly. So thank you also so bring, for bringing that piece up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people in my community have been so great at making me feel good. And so, but it's like made me think differently about how I would support other artists too. So you know, maybe seeing like someone doing similar work and messaging them and telling them how much their work means to them, knowing that they're probably facing backlash. Uh, so it's it's been like a good experience for me too to understand just how much those messages mean, especially when you're getting other ones that are telling you that it's disgusting and whatnot. Um, and also acknowledging like, uh, it like backlash from our own communities too. Um, that's hard to deal with too. And I'm not gonna lie, like when it pisses indigenous or it pisses white men off, I don't really get upset about it. <laughs> kind of like, gosh, yeah, like I'm doing something good. <laughs> yeah, like, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it hurts like when it comes from in our own communities. Um, but it doesn't mean we. You know, when we're speaking our truths, we got to remember that we're speaking our truths. And so as someone who's who is like an intergenerational survivor of residential schools, also being cognizant of how distorted our relationships to our bodies have been through that through that system and being gentle with our communities, too, because there are a lot of um, there is a lot of resistance towards talking about our bodies, talking about things like masturbation and bleeding in a good way. So it's kind of like a mixture of just, um, yeah, kind of understanding the context of where some of those community critiques might come from and trying to find ways to not let those critiques land in our own bodies and maybe finding ways to help make this work more accessible to people who have undergone other various forms of systematic sexual violence through the settler state. So that's kind of the point that I'm starting to think about is how, how do I create work that speaks to me and speaks to my generation, my relationships, my friends, and then maybe also make work that speaks to those people that have been impacted in a different way, um, who have had their sexualities and their relationships to their bodies specifically and systematically, you know, targeted and how we see that play play out in our communities when we try and do things like talk about our bodies and moon time and stuff like that. For sure. Yeah, I appreciate that note. Uh, and out of respect for your time, uh, maybe we can go ahead and wrap up. I would ask, uh, so if listeners would like to find out more about your work, uh, where can they check out some of your paintings and this beautiful writing that we have been speaking to? Mm -hmm. So I have a website called quillviolet.com. Uh, it's not currently updated, but I will update it soon. That's where you can find kind of my paintings. My most active social media is Instagram. Uh, so you can find me at Ronchi Quay is my handle. Uh, and then the, the article is on Guts Magazine. So if you just Google Guts and then uh, my name, you'll find the article. But I'll post it to my website soon. But Instagram is definitely the place I'm most active kind of given up on Facebook and stuff. So <laughs> uh, look, looking forward to more of us doing that. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, thank you for sharing that information. I'll be sure to hyperlink to them as well so that our listeners can check those links out. Awesome. Yeah, it was so nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and energy and generosity and sharing everything that you did. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I hope one day we'll get to meet in person. Yes, I'm looking forward to that also. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions. 
a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by the Grassroots Adult Freedom School Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadia, and I thank you for listening. What did this dialogue evoke for you? You're welcome to post questions and reflections in the comment section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our free show archive. The Liberation Spring YouTube page also has the video recordings of most all of our dialogues, too. If you'd like more information on this show's topic, including upcoming online classes and one-on-one community independent studies, check out liberationspring.com. To donate to the project, check out Liberation Spring's Patreon page. Thanks to Climbing Poetry for our theme song, We Rise for technical production, and Grammy Award-nominated Zion Angelus of Baby Mamahood for our opening. Please consider leaving a rating or review so others can find out about the show. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud.